Hello everybody, I hope you're okay. Sorry if this is kind of coming at you sort of like a day later, but it's because the official release dropped today, so I kind of want to keep myself consistent. We actually got confirmation during the week that it was in fact chapter 986 that made the editor cry, and to be quite honest with you, I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, if you cry, you cry, right? I, I think he's allowed to express his emotions, uh, so that's all good. That being said, if you ever need to learn how to overhype something, make sure you give that editor a call. Although, he probably won't answer you because he'll be too busy crying. This week's color spread has a bunch of bulldogs in it that represent the admirals. You can tell because of their color scheme. Yellow is Kizaru, blue is Aokiji, red is Akainu, purple is Fujitora, and of course, the fact that the animals are bulldogs, bulldog, green bull, it's a reference to the final admiral. So again, I would not be surprised if some of the marines get involved in Wano. Now each of the guys is wearing something that is a reference to something else in the story. So for example, Sanji is wearing these swirly noodle patterns on his shirt, and he's also using his hands to hold a pistol, which is interesting because we know that Sanji does not use his hands when he fights. The only time we've seen him use his hands to fight was when he was fighting Wanzi. And so of course we know that Wanzi was the noodle man, right? And so those noodles kind of go along with Sanji's shirt here. Uh, he also has a three on his shirt, and you can also see the number 66. Like you have like two sixes there as well. And so those are all references to Germa. Brook appears to have an ink pattern on his shirt, but also the stripes on his shirt are basically the pattern of the keys of a piano. So I thought that was interesting. Usopp has like a yak on his shirt with horns, and so we know that the numbers all have horns on their head. And so those are the characters that Usopp will be fighting as predicted by one of his lies. Another interesting thing about Usopp here is that his slingshot is not his regular Kabuto, because post time skip, Usopp's slingshot is black and it can expand. The one he has in this color spread is actually his Soga King weapon, or the weapon that he used, you know, for the first time when he appeared as Soga King. So I'm, I'm interested in why it was that Oda decided to draw Usopp with his Soga King slingshot. Robin has her hands on Frankie's sideburns, or his face, like she's petting his face. So that's another point for Robin. And then I wonder if Frankie's shoulders being black could signify that he's gonna awaken armament hockey during this battle. Oda finally decided to include Jimbei in a color spread, so just his mere presence here speaks for itself. And Jimbei is wearing a martial arts polar bear. And given what happens by the end of this chapter, I think this is a reference to us seeing not only the minks go Sulong, but also Beppo going Sulong form. Like, can you imagine what Law would look like riding into battle on a giant, deranged polar bear monster? That would be awesome. The palm tree branches on Zoro's shirt take me back to his fight in Alabasta, where he learns to listen to the rhythm of things so that he can cut steel. It's one of the very early foreshadowings of armament and observation hockey. He remembers that his master taught him about how the best swordsman in the world can cut anything and nothing. So before he defeats Mr. One, he slashes at a palm tree branch and he doesn't cut it. And then later on in Wano, Hyogoro reveals that that's actually the secret principle behind being able to use Ryo. And then of course we have Luffy holding a pipe, which is a reference to his brothers, Ace and Sabo. To this day, Sabo still uses his to fight, and then Luffy is also wearing a shirt with fruits, representing the Gomu Gomu no Mi. And I think these fruits could also mean that Luffy's Devil Fruit Awakening is coming. You know, so hopefully we get to see that soon in his battle against Kaido. I can't read what Chopper's shirt says because it's in Japanese. So I can't figure out what that's a reference to, but it does look like Nami is whispering a very exciting secret to Chopper. Chopper's face is lighting up like, I gotta be honest, the first page of this chapter, in my opinion, was pretty much a waste of a page because it's essentially just the gray flashback panels of stuff that we've already seen. Right, so it just seemed like it was a way to take up space. I mean, I guess it's kind of there to drive the point home that Kaido is thinking about Odin while the scabbards are attacking him, but we already knew that from the last chapter. That whole page of that flashback really reminded me of the stuff that Kishimoto would do at times just to fill in space in his chapters, where he would show us like little snippets of flashbacks 
of stuff that we already knew. Kaido is going down, his scar starts throbbing, starts hurting again, and some of the blades that the scabbards have start piercing him. We'll get into that in a second, but first I just want to read you what Kaido says as he's falling down. He says, why do their blades pierce me? Do they use his Rio too? So it looks like Kaido is essentially confirming that at least some of them, maybe not all of them, but at least some of the scabbards know how to use Rio. Now before the flame wars start, I want to make sure that I take my time to explain what Rio actually is and why is it possible that, you know, at least some of the scabbards could know how to use Rio. Okay, so just to be clear, Rio is a different stage of armament hockey. We know this because Rio has a different functionality. When Luffy is trying to learn to use Rio, he is disappointed that he can only use basic hardening. And he says it over and over again. Like this thing I'm doing here right now, it's just normal armament hockey. So Rio is different. And we also know that it's different because not a whole lot of characters are able to use Rio in the One Piece verse. Like the use of Rio isn't something that is very common. So if Rio were the same thing as basic armament hockey, everybody would be using it. But instead we've only seen a select few characters use it. Like the Admirals, Hyogoro, Sentomaru, Rayleigh. Okay, so what is Rio then? Rio is a technique. Offensively speaking, Rio is the ability to shoot hockey out of your body. The way that Luffy defines it is that it's the ability to send your enemies flying without touching them. That stated, Ryo is not to be confused with what the Kuja pirates can do where they coat arrows with normal armament hockey and then they fire those arrows. That's just basic armament hockey that they're using because they're touching the object and coating it with hockey. So it's not the same thing as Ryo. So the next question is, how come the scabbards can use it if we've never seen them use it before? And if, to our knowledge, we've never seen them train hard like Luffy did to be able to learn how to use Rio. Okay, well, first of all, we don't know what kind of training the scabbards went through when they were with Odin. Uh, so that's still a mystery. However, there is one main point that makes it very believable that at least some of the scabbards would know how to use Rio. And that's the fact that Rio is a technique that is a lot easier to do if you are a swordsman. Zoro showed hints of it as early as Alabasta because of what his teacher taught him about how some samurai in Wano can use their swords to cut everything and nothing. Now, after Zoro uses it in Alabasta, it's not like he goes on to use it all the time. In fact, he says he can't. He can't use it because it's a very special type of technique that he hasn't mastered yet. So he was only able to use it in Alabasta because he was near the brink of death, and as we know, hockey blooms in extreme situations. Plus, another reason for why Zoro was able to use Ryo back then, even before Luffy, is because he's a swordsman. So the concept of Ryo is already kind of embedded within the training of a proper swordsman. And the scabbards are proper swordsmen. At least a chunk of them are. For example, Raizo in this chapter has his blades on Kaido's neck, but Raizo is more of a ninja than he is a swordsman. So I think, like, he would not be an expert at using Ryo. But characters like Denjiro, Ashura Doji, Kawamatsu, Kiku, I have no problem believing that they would know how to use Ryo because of their swordsman training. So basically, being able to perform Ryo comes a lot easier if you have a good sword and are a properly trained swordsman. Like, if you meet those two conditions, you're probably not going to have to do as much training as Luffy did to learn how to how to use Rio. because if you have a good sword, the sword kind of does a lot of the work for you uh, because it helps you channel the Rio. This is why I was asking in my last review, what kind of swords do the scabbards have? Like, we know Kiku has a special sword because it has an added effect. So it's not just a normal sword. So for example, right, Luffy struggled to learn how to use Rio, how to use a technique, because he doesn't use a sword. So he had to learn how to channel his energy onto his fist. But if you have the right sword, the weapon helps you with that, helps you channel the energy. Like in chapter 955, Hitetsu tells Zoro that Enma is a sword that absorbs the user's hockey automatically. And because of that, Zoro can use Rio to shoot the energy out of the thing and it's strong enough that it cuts the edge of a cliff off, casually. That's also the same reason for why Odin was able to cut Kaido, because Enma 
was allowing Odin to use Rio. The problem with Enma though is that it, it absorbs way too much, so you have to be very careful with it. But the basic principle is still the same, which is that having a proper sword and being a good swordsman makes using Rio a lot easier. Now I'm gonna read you part of the dialogue that Kiku has in chapter 985 when she's talking to Kanjiro and she's about to fight him, right? So she has her katana out and Kiku says this, she says, you may shut your mouth now, Kanjudo. The wounds this one's katana leaves do not vanish in the afterlife. Like snow that remains into spring, they will continue to torment your soul for eternity. And in this chapter, a wound that Kaido received from Odin with Ryo actually hurts him. So if you make the connections with what's been established before, it's not too crazy to suggest that at least some of the scabbards would have some knowledge about how to use Rio. So we get this large elongated beam of Rio hitting the ground, creating a crater, very reminiscent of the panel where we first got introduced to Kaido where he falls down from the sky. And then some of the beast pirates are like, oh, we gotta interfere. But uh, Kyogoro and some of the allied forces block their way. Yamato notices that those were in fact Odin's scabbards, so she's running and she tells Luffy, hurry Luffy, we gotta go finish off that giant cow gorilla. Angry Hinata comes out of nowhere swinging at Yamato with a mace, spiky club, and she says, you're gonna pay for what you did, Yamato. What was up with that? Today is finally the day where I become Batman. So it looks like Yamato and Ulti are gonna be fighting this arc. And in terms of like fresh, newly introduced characters who are quirky, I could not have picked a better pair. Nami and Carrots use their electric-based attacks to easily escape Big Mom's homies, which to me gets me to think that they could have escaped whenever, they could have freed themselves whenever they wanted, but they were waiting for Shinobu to escape safely so that she can save Momonosuke. So I think that was part of Nami's plan. Uh, I think they were just acting as distractions or a, a diversion for the homies so that Shinobu could get away safely. Ma, 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 ma shows up all of a sudden to confront Luffy. And something that I find very interesting is that if you notice, Oda has been very careful about not putting Luffy in front of both Yonko at the same time. So in this case, he's in front of Big Mom, but Kaido's somewhere else dealing with the scabbards, right? So that's a little bit of plot convenience kicking in there like trying to keep Luffy safe, trying to prevent him from standing in front of the two Yonko and challenging them at the same time, because if that were to happen, like Luffy would be KO'd. That's a fact. So yeah, he's been very careful about, you know, keeping that distance. I like how when Kaido is surrounded by the scabbards, he kind of takes us through the story in a way, kind of goes back to follow that narrative thread. It all started in Punk Hazard, and then you went to Dressrosa, then you went to Zoe. It's kind of like he's breaking the fourth wall a bit and talking directly to the reader, like saying, I know how long it's taken you to get to this point. And then Kaido says something that I thought was super interesting when he's talking to the samurai about the fact that they joined forces with pirates. This is what Kaido says. I think it's gonna be a nudge to his backstory. So Kaido says this to Kinemon. He says, but pirates will betray you. When they know you'll lose, they will abandon you and sail away. That line has to be a reference to Rox D. Sebek. If you remember back during the God's Valley incident, back when Kaido was an apprentice under Rox, Roger and Garp teamed up to fight against Sebek, and they actually won. They beat him. So I'm pretty sure that Kaido is referencing the fact that his captain, his Sancho, Sancho! Rox abandoned his crew when Roger and Garp showed up, all right? That has to be, what other thing could he be talking about in that panel? Pirates betray you. When it looks like they will lose, they will sail away and abandon you? Does that mean that Rox escaped God's Valley? Does that mean that he's still alive? Because I remember when Sengoku was talking about Rox, it was very vague. I read a lot of translations about what Sengoku was saying, 
And for the most part, the idea was that he said something like, you know, Rox is not of this world anymore, or he's no longer around anymore. But it didn't make it seem, that the dialogue didn't make it seem as if he was gone forever. I said this in my Rox video, why would Oda spend almost, almost an entire chapter hyping up Rox? You know, it's, it's the chapter when we get the bounties of the Yonko and of, of uh, Roger. Uh, he spends almost half a chapter hyping up this character. For what? It's very strange. If he's never going to reintroduce Rox into the story, if we're never going to see Rox again, why spend so much time having Sengoku hyping this character up? It's very strange. Very strange. And so this, this panel, this very small panel of Kaido mentioning that is my favorite part of this week's chapter. I also really like Kinemon's response to Kaido. It's like he's having his like, Luffy will be the one to become King of the Pirates moment that we've seen some of the Straw Hats have, right? So he's responding like, Luffy is not like that. You know, you're crazy. And then he says, even if every last one of us dies, he will remain. Which to me, that sounds a little bit like something Pedro would say. Like it almost makes me feel like Kinemon is saying that he would gladly sacrifice himself for Luffy. Now, if you look at the panel where Big Mom asks Luffy, Straw Hat, what are you doing here? Why did you come to Wano? If you look at that panel at the top, you see the cross where Momonosuke is supposed to be. And then on either side of the X, you see King on one side and then you see Queen on the other. So I'm kind of curious, like, why is it that they're just standing around there? I mean, because Queen has a minor role in this chapter, you know, giving orders and such, but King is pretty much absent throughout the entire thing. So, you know, they, they just seem to be standing around there in that panel. Apparently, like the rest of us, Luffy still believes that Orochi is still alive because he mentions his name as well as Kaido and Big Mom during his declaration of war. So I wonder if he doesn't know what Kaido did to Orochi or if he just doesn't believe that he's dead. And I think that since Luffy is yelling directly at Big Mom in that panel, I think what we're gonna see is sort of like a rematch thing of the scene that happened in Udon. If you remember, like Luffy was barely kind of getting used to using Rio. He was learning how to use Rio, and at one point he wanted to deflect uh, a Big Mom swing, right, that was coming at him, but he failed, and Big Mom sent him flying, crashing into a wall. So I think what Oda's gonna do here is that he's gonna sort of like showcase Luffy's improvement since then, and we're gonna see kind of like a repetition of that but I think Luffy will be a little bit more successful this time. I don't want to be mean, but I got to say, it's kind of funny how Luffy's saying, this is an all-out war against Kaido, Big Mom, and Orochi. And then the moment Kaido flies away with the scabbards, right? Luffy's like, Luffy's like, don't worry, I'll catch up with you later. So it is kind of the plot convenience there kicking in. And that's okay, you know, because that's the only way that Kaido goes down. You know, if other people, if other characters deal some damage first and then Luffy comes in along with the rest of the supernova and take him down that way. Otherwise, it's just not believable that Kaido would fall. So yeah, just, I just love that moment. It was very funny. And just like in the previous chapter, Oda gives us this triple supernova panel. He actually shows them in the same order as he did in the last chapter as well, with Zoro first, only this time there are some allied forces behind him. Then we get Kid, and he's with Killer, and we see a Yakuza boss behind them as well. And then we get Law, who apparently has allied himself with Hawkins now. So Hawkins is there as well. I think most of us expect the supernovas to form some kind of temporary alliance with each other to take Kaido down, kind of like what happened in Stampede. The last time we saw Hawkins was in chapter 954, Law had actually defeated him, he actually cut him in half, and he was in a jail cell. And Hawkins was explaining to Law that the only reason for why he joined Kaido was because Apu betrayed their alliance, and that he had zero chances of survival if he refused to join Kaido. So he essentially joined Kaido because he had no other choice. And then he also goes on to ask Law how things are in his alliance with Luffy. So it seemed, even from back then, that Hawkins was already interested in joining Luffy's side. So that part was kind of predictable, kind of expected. What was surprising, however, and I don't think anybody predicted this, was that Marco and Pedro Spero would team up. These two are storming right inside through the main entrance. You can tell because you see the giant uh, katana there on the right side of the panel. So the shadow that Marco spotted on the water was definitely Perorin 
Marco was probably getting ready to kick him down the waterfall again. And then Pedro Spedo was probably like, oh no, not this again. I'm not here for this. Hey Marco, I'll make you a deal. I'll work with you if you don't kick me down that waterfall again. Because Pedro Spedo hates the alliance that Big Mom has with Kaido. He doesn't trust it at all. And so I think he's there for moms. And ultimately, you know, aside from fighting with Carrot, I think another reason for why Pedro Spedo is there is so that he can provide Big Mom with a way to escape the island. I think Nami is going to reclaim Zeus by the end of the arc. And so I don't think Big Mom will be able to use him to escape. And so I think she's going to be using Pedro Spedo's candy sea slug to leave Wano once everything starts collapsing and falling in on itself. Like I said, Queen has a very small part in this chapter, but I loved his dialogue where he says, I want every single drunk on this island to prepare for battle immediately. Kaido goes dragon form and the scabbards grab a hold of him before he can fly away. And something interesting that Kaido does is that he essentially crashes through the roof of the skull, right? So he's essentially opening up a hole on the top of the skull. And so because of that opening, I think what's gonna happen is that that's going to let the moonlight shine through to the lower level. So characters like Carrot, who were left behind, who are on the, on the same floor as Nami and Luffy, like she'll be able to transform because of that giant hole that Kaido made. Because remember, in order for Minx to go so long, they need to be able to see the moon. On that note, I also really liked how Oda planned it to have the Minx forming ranks outside, waiting silently there. And according to Nekomamushi, the reason for why the Minx suspected that they should wait outside is because they knew Kaido would not be fighting in dragon form inside of the dome, inside of the skull. I kind of think that Oda must have shown that final page of Kaido towering in the moonlight against the nine red scabbards to the animators. The animators of the One Piece opening because the way that panel is framed, like the composition of that panel is just so similar to this shot right here that we see in the new anime opening. I also really liked Kaido's dialogue in that last page because it reminds me of Scar from The Lion King when he says, oh Simba, you're in trouble again. Only this time, Daddy Odin isn't here to save you. I loved the official translation for throwing in this pun with Nekomamushi's dialogue. He says, the snow is light like flower petals, the perfect night to watch the full moon. Turns out the full moon turns Nekomamushi into the Cheshire Cat. And the moment is such a reality check because it just brings you back to the time it was first foreshadowed where the minx were planning on going to Wano to become full Sulong against Kaido's forces, which was back in Zo. I mean, th this took a long time. And it's kind of like a strange place to be because even though it took a while for that bit of foreshadowing to pay off, I honestly was not expecting this to happen this early in the battle. I thought we were going to be well into the fight against Kaido before the Minks showed their trump card. So this surprised me in a really good way. Uh, well, in a good way, but also it's kind of frightening because it's like, man, like Oda's pacing, like he's doing this quick, like he's doing this a lot faster than I thought he would. Last chapter I said that I didn't think that Nekomamushi and Inuarashi could die because we had not seen their Sulong forms yet. And then this chapter came out. So we're gonna be seeing a whole bunch of Mink Sulong transformations next time. Thus far in the story, we've only seen two. We've seen Carrot's transformation, and then the anime, I think, did a pretty good job at showcasing Peckham's Sulong form. They all start glowing white for whatever reason, and then the Minx can use Electro, so get ready for those electrical discharges on Kaido next time. Now, from what we know about Inuarashi and Nekomamushi feet-wise, right? Back in Zo, Nekomamushi was able to flip a mammoth in his base form. Right, just straight up went up to Jack, flipped him by the trunk. So I can't wait to see what Neko can do in his Sulong form. And then Inuarashi blocked an attack from Jack's trunk with one arm. Now, that being said, it's important to remember the facts. It's important to be fair. Uh, the fight against Jack lasted for five days, all right? And Neko Mamushi and Inuarashi would take turns during those five days. Inuarashi's group would fight Jack for 12 hours and then they would go away. 
to be replaced with Nekomamushi and his group who would fight Jack for the remaining 12 hours of the day. During the fifth day, it seems like the Minks are getting a little bit of the upper hand. It seems possible like they might bring home the win, but unfortunately Jack decides to say, screw this, and he uses Caesar Clown's gas to poison the Minks. And so he wins that way. So because of what I just said, plus the fact that Luffy is nowhere near Kaido at the moment, not, not just Luffy, but none of the supernovas are around where Kaido is. And because of what I said with Jack and Zoe, I don't think, even with Sulong form, I, I sincerely, actually, no, I'm pretty sure that it's not gonna be enough for Kaido, like to take down Kaido. It's definitely not gonna be enough. I think I'm worried that the Minx and the Samurai are going to be used as hype tools to hype Kaido up even more. That doesn't mean that I think that the Minx and the Samurai won't deal some damage to Kaido. I think, I think, I mean, they already have in this chapter. So I think they will do that a little bit more. But for the most part, I think Kaido is going to have a lot of fun. When Luffy fought Kaido, he was drunk. And by the end of this chapter, look at what Kaido says. He says, I think I've sobered up now. Oh no. No wonder Luffy told Kinemon, yeah, you guys go first. The wounds that the scabbards gave Kaido were just enough to sober him up. I'm expecting death. I'm expecting one shots from Kaido. This is where the mess begins, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you did. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Let me know what you thought about the chapter and about the points that I made in this video. Overall, I thought this chapter was really good. Really, really exciting chapter. Nice cliffhanger. It's just, I think we're gonna be getting these types of crazy chapters a lot more often from here on out. Thanks again, take care of yourselves. Catch you later, bye.